Okay, so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce my postdoc advisor, Miroslav Payech. So he's a professor, Miroslav is a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. And his research spans the breadth of high assurance autonomous CPS. And that's something which we really care about at Galva. So he's done some foundational work in attack resilient CPS system and formal approaches for designing and analyzing embedded medical devices. Uh, something that is pretty, pretty crazy that we barely have work there. So, uh, so I'm guessing from the talk's title, uh, he's going to talk about the security aspects of autonomous CPS, um, which have a pretty interesting attack surface and how to reason about them and design methodologies for attack resilient CPS focused on providing safety and performance guarantees, I guess. So, well, take it away, Miroslav. Perfect. It's a, it's a real pleasure to virtually be here. Hopefully next time I, I can visit you guys. Um, yes, this time I will not talk about, about our medical work. Um, we do a lot on, on, on that domain as well, high assurance medical uh, software design. For example, now we are just going to start um, clinical trials of, of uh, closed loop uh, deep brain stimulation. But what I'm going to focus here is the, 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 the main research that we have done over the, the last few years on, on how we're building these kind of cyber physical systems that, that have varying levels of autonomy but that we take security as as major citizen uh, when when we build them and um, this is a slide that i always start with since i started working on on this project uh on, on this type of research since, since 2012. i hear some echo let me just check so um pretty much i've stopped updating these things because every week or two weeks we have a new attack uh, exposing whether is it uh, uh, in, in analog domain, whether is it in the, in the software, in hardware, etc. Um, so pretty much the problem is that we really have to think about how can we secure this uh, CPS, uh, these systems, and uh, the, the fact that we are dealing with increased levels of autonomy is really making the problem even even worse because uh, there is significant challenge in providing high assurance even when you don't have malicious interference. What happens? Uh, uh, in, when you have malicious interference, it's, it's almost a beast of, on its own. So, uh, I will not talk about, I am fully aware that, that, that you guys are, are, uh, know a lot about different attack surfaces, etc. What I'm just going to focus on, on uh, if you look at abstracting attacks on, on control and autonomy components in CPS, um, uh, how they affect the impact of, the, of, of these types of, of services. So, 30,000 feet view of the problem is you can look at sensing attacks, actuation attacks, attacks on the communication between components, and attacks on the, on the controller itself. And um, in a lot of these cases, um, these types of attacks can be modeled as malicious interference signals uh, that have certain properties that are introduced uh, uh, into the, the, the overall closed loop, into this kind of uh, feedback loop. Uh, and uh, as a result, we have to introduce defenses against them as a part of the overall system design. Another thing is if you have types of attacks that, that, uh, that affect impact resources of some of these uh, components, for example, if you're able to, to exploit, let's say, the, the, the hardware model that you have and, and your uh, vulnerabilities and you are able to, to, to install malware, that will take over some of the, the computational time and you reduce computation from 20 uh, hertz to five hertz or two hertz of your controller, that kind of impact is, is, is harder to directly capture as, as these malicious interference signals. So in order to do that, we actually have to look at how these types of, of systems are built. And effectively, if we look at control and autonomy stack, we pretty much, let's look at autonomous vehicles, but whether is it UAVs or, 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 or cars or underwater vehicles that you guys use in, in assured autonomy. Pretty much you have this kind of low level controller, uh, tactical planner, short horizon views, and, and uh, mission planner, which is long horizon view. And in these different layers of, of, of autonomy, you are looking at different types of, of, of control problems and the analysis that you need to, to have. Um, on this low level, you're looking at continuous state space, whether you look at discrete time or, 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 um, or continuous time, but the state space is continuous and then you have to look at 
some of the, whether it's standard old fashioned types of controllers like PIDs, uh, MPCs, et cetera, or if you're looking at now, we're gonna dump a, a neural network here and, and use it to close the, the, the loop. And maybe uh, incorporate even some of the higher levels as a part of the neural network itself. Then the next one is you have this kind of basic switching between these different types of, of controllers and you're looking at some kind of automata based analysis. And finally, you have the, the high level planning that you would have if you want to go from point A to point B. Uh, you are building on top of some kind of probabilistic stochastic models, like whether we talk about macro decision processes or partially observable macro decision processes, MDPs and POMDPs. And as a result, we have these different types of formalisms that, that capture behavior of the system and, uh, and the behavior of the, of the, of the physical component. Of as a result, if you want to add resilience across all these different levels of, of control and autonomy stack, we really have to add resiliency between each of, in, in each of these designs, but in way to ensure that it is easy to understand how decisions and guarantees on one layer impact the, 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 the layer uh, below. Um, another thing that we also have to think about is how can we integrate these kind of components uh, on a, in a platform aware manner. Why? Because in some sense, we will really end up, uh, we, let's say that we are looking at DOD systems or, or even modern uh, vehicles uh, that are consumer-based uh, systems, you have very long lifetime of these devices. So even if you're able to run a lot of things at a particular point of time, as the, 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 the lifetime of these devices expand, you will at some point come to the, the, the resource constraint setup. Uh, in some senses, you already are there. So in, how can we build these systems in a way that, that we can provide this quantitative trade-off between, between the security guarantees um, that certain services and certain modules uh, provide and the available architecture that, that we can have today. So what I'm gonna do in the, in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can add resiliency at these different layers of, of autonomy. Um, um, starting from the low level up to the, the high level and different types of modeling and analysis techniques and tools that we have developed as a part of the process. So my work started uh, on this topic as a part of the DARPA Hackers project. Galois was a huge part of, of this. Unfortunately, we were in ground team. You guys were in, in aerial team. So uh, we did not work as, as, as close as uh, we, we should have maybe. Uh, but in, um, in, as a part of our design, what we did then, we, uh, my focus was on designing these kind of attack resilient controllers. And uh, on the ground vehicle that, uh, that uh, DARPA provided, this Landshark, we implemented resilient point-to-point uh, um, -point, uh, controller with, with adaptive cruise control, while on a 2013 model of an American built car, we again built uh, a state estimator. We were not allowed actually to perform control there. But we showed how, if you start with from a clean slate architecture, how we can build these kind of resilient control components that can provide us with high level of assurance uh, and, and strong, very strong performance guarantees in the presence of attack. However, these types of guarantees only hold if you have, let's say, uh, P out of Q sensors that are under attack in this particular setup. So for example, we have this cruise controller and yes, you can adapt uh, attack odometry sensors that are sending uh, data over, over the bus, uh, uh, odometry measurements to the, uh, the, the, the controller, but you still have uh, GPS, you still have the, the, the current that the engine is using, and from those you can extract the estimate of the, of the system state. So what we learned as a part of the, the Hotkins project is that you cannot solve everything, everything with only on the algorithmic level. You cannot design controller and a learning and control algorithms that provide you with high level of resiliency uh, in, uh, in, in, in all of the setups, in all of the attack models that, that have, been, have been seen so far. Why? Well, let's look at a very simple, the lowest level control model. So we look at, for example, whether we look at the legacy system that was the main focus of our efforts as a part of r and uh, project projects that, that we were on, or, or whether we are looking at, at the architecture that we developed as a part of the, the, the Hawkins project. Pretty much 
as a result of the attack, let's say network-based attack, the, the attacker can push the system um, wherever he or she wants without triggering, without uh, potentially uh, triggering the attack. That's the worst case uh, alarm. That is the worst case attack that can get happen. So a stealthy attack that does not trigger intrusion detector while pushing the system uh, wherever the attacker wants. So in this particular setup, when we have network-based attacks, it does not make sense to assume that we'll have three out of 10 sensors that are not under attack. If the, 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 the attacker has full access on the, on the bus and can launch, for example, many in the middle attacks, you do not have any kind of, of guarantees. So one of the fundamental results that we were able to, to have, uh, even if we look at uh, very uh, nonlinear systems, was that if you build this kind of physics model-based detectors uh, and you corrupt enough sensors, they cannot protect us from intelligent attackers. So the attacker will be able to push us wherever he or she wants without trig even triggering the, these kind of physics-based alarms. So now it's cool, let's look at everything. Can learning help? Can we use uh, um, um, uh, large data sets and build these intrusion detections in a, in, a, in, a, in a smarter way? And pretty much there is no help with certain types of, of attacks if you compromise enough enough resources, if you compromise enough sensors, you can really, you can really build, um, you can really build these kind of attacks that, that, that are, they stay undetected. And, and again, we were able to have analytic solutions for simpler systems, uh, for very complex systems, our recent approach uses adversarial learning. And for example, for lane keeping controller, we are able to insert attacks that steer the, the vehicle off road while uh, remaining stealth. So pretty much if we look at the problem that we previously uh, considered where we have this kind of network-based attacks, if the attacker is able to, to send malicious packets over the, the, the network, he or she is able to, to, to take over the system to push it uh, wherever, wherever uh, he wants. And as a result, we will end up with, with unsafe behavior. So one solution to do this is to say, okay, let's, if we are worrying about communication-based, uh, attacks like network based attacks can be authenticated, can we protect all of these messages? So, the thing that uh, as a part of the, of the Intel and NSF Center on, on, on CPS security and privacy, we were focused on, on automotive applications. And what happens, for example, we look at, at, at CAN, and what happens here is that CAN is already overutilized. So, and you are running these kind of uh, processes in a very periodic manner, and you really have to ensure that all of the packages are arriving at a time when, when they need to be consumed. So, if all of a sudden you start extending 16 bit messages by adding additional header to add this uh, message authentication codes, all of a sudden the, the, the previously uh, schedulable system you have the messages become larger and all of a sudden you will get timing uh, constraints that are violated. However, what can happen in this particular setup is that we can see that we can occasionally authenticate, protect some of the messages. So there is no way that we can protect every message all the time, but we can protect some, message, some messages some, in some time instances. Um, and so from the schedulability, from the research perspective, that seems to be enough. But the question is, does that provide us with this high level quality of, of control uh, 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 guarantees that we can have in this particular setup? So we started asking ourselves, does intermittent use of, of authentication help? Because in this particular setup, what that will allow us is to have this kind of security per dollar guarantees. Communication and computation resources are shared. They, we talk about usually resource constrained systems. So is it possible to add this kind of mechanism without affecting normal operation? There is one thing that directly comes into mind and that is if we, let's look at, for example, this setup that we had here. If we run two processes at 50 Hertz, let's say break by wire and adaptive cruise control, and we want to protect messages that are sent on the bus. So we cannot run them at, at 50 Hertz, but maybe we can run them at 25 Hertz such that we extend the messages that are sent on the bus. The problem with that approach is if you protect now all the messages, you reduce the frequency of executing these, these uh, modules, these controllers. And as a result, what you end up with is, is reduced quality of control. 
So you don't want to be able to, you don't want to pay the penalty of adding security guarantees by reducing the quality of, of system performance when the system is not under attack. So what you want is when the system is not under attack, everything stays the same. When the system is under attack, ideally we would like to be able to provide this kind of uh, strong guarantees about quality of control, performance degradation in the presence of attack. And those guarantees to be quantifiable as a function of available resources. So we started looking at this problem and one of the first works that we focused was on this kind of physics aware because we are trying to control certain systems, enforcement and utilization of security penalties. So we look at, let's look at the back to the same model that we had. This is like a 30,000 feet view on, on control. We have controller that is getting data from the sensors over, over a network and then transmitting to the actuators. And we look at a very powerful attack model that has full knowledge of the system of the deployed intrusion detection and the attacker can inject any false measurement signal except at points where integrity is enforced. So yes, the attacker in those kinds of setups can launch denial of service attacks, but in these kind of predictable systems, those after a certain level of rate of, of lost messages are easily uh, to detect. And we look at the worst case kind of setup where the attacker wants to, wants to remain stealthy. So what we were able to show is that even if intermittently you are able to push to protect certain messages. So even if intermittently you are able to provide trust in some of the information that is being delivered and used, you cannot uh, push the system wherever, the, the attacker cannot push the system wherever he wants. So this is what in some sense we call this perfectly attackable system. But that was not enough because we still don't have this quantifiable guarantees that we can have. So what we looked at is we were able to build this kind of formal uh, uh, analysis tool that provides us with reachable region of the state estimation under attack. So in this particular setup, what we have is adaptive cruise control. And the, 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 the basic idea is very simple. The attacker, if he wants to stay stealthy, he needs to insert attacks in a way that, that slowly increases the error of the system, slowly takes us off course. So what does that mean? That means that the error cannot significantly increase immediately. So uh, what happens if we protect every fourth message? Well, all of a sudden, what we have is that the, the, the uncertainty significantly reduces. It's not zero, but it significantly, significantly reduces. So you end up having this kind of breathing where the error increases, error increases, error increases, and then decreases. And increases, increases, and then decreases. And the crucial part of this is, is our reachability analysis that for different types of detectors provide us with these kind of reachable regions uh, in the presence of attacks. All right, so let's look at, we have several case studies. One of them was uh, vehicle platooning. And uh, we first look at vehicle platooning where we are uh, messing up with information that is sent to the, the, the second car. And as you can see, we are launching a very aggressive attack that is not triggering intrusion detection that is implemented on this car, but as you can see, it hits car in front and it will take him, it, it will take the car off the, 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 the treadmill. As you can see, it's taking it off the treadmill. The moment we turn off the attack, everything goes back to where it's supposed to. If we really have way more time to, to do this kind of attack, we can even be uh, more aggressive, less aggressive. And then you can see here, it's really, really slowly how this changes, how this attack, the, the car is, is thinking that it's maintaining its position, but it's actually getting closer to the vehicle in front. And in two minutes, it will hit the vehicle and take it off, off the, the, the track. So this is a standard architecture, the legacy system that we looked, and we launch these types of attacks. So what happens in setups where we protect some of the information? So look at the previous setup, but now one out of five messages is protected. So the attacker is able to insert four messages to the second vehicle about its position, but the fifth one has to be protected and every fifth one is protected. So what you see here is not an attack. This is the worst case attack that can happen based on the reachability analysis that we had. So this is the worst case stealthy attack. And you can see that if we protect only 20% of the information, all of a sudden 
the impact of attack on the on the system itself is is uh, uh, really really small. Okay. So again, what I really want to highlight is based on the reachability analysis. This is not an average attack or random attack or something like that. This is the worst case attack that ensures that the attacker does not trigger the the the, the anomaly uh, detector. On the other hand. Uh, what happens if we what happens if we if we protect every twentieth information if five percent of the packets are outside? What you end up here, this is what happens now. So so nineteen out of twenty packets can be whatever. And here again, we are looking at the worst case attack. So this is the worst case attack that does not trigger that does not trigger uh, uh, alarm on the on the on the second vehicle. So you can see that this is, it, the vehicle almost hits the car in front, but it doesn't. So you can see now that what we have is this kind of error, how many resources we dedicate to, to integrity enforcement versus what is the performance degradation in the, in the presence of attack, which now allows us to build this kind of quantifiable metric, which is on one case, we have inter enforcement distance, which is how often do we use this security primitive message authentication in this particular case versus what is the quality of control degradation. And now based on that one, we can do, for example, for, for drone trajectory tracking, what we have is we can see that, for example, this is the, the tracking error of a certain trajectory. If, that, if it doesn't have attack, that the error is, is very small due to noise. If we protect every second packet, you have one type of error. This is, again, the worst case error. And if you protect every fourth packet, 24, 25% utilization of, of authenticating the messages, we still have the quality the, of control that is um, uh, below the, 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 the allowed performance degradation. So what does this mean? All of a sudden now we have this kind of quality of control curves, uh, uh, required resources and the performance degradation. And although we get them based on this kind of reachability analysis tools, it turns out that we can quite well approximate them with piecewise linear functions, which all of a sudden now allows us to do what in embedded systems and in design automation we can really do very well. And that is this kind of resource, optimal resource allocation. And we looked at three different types of, of, of scheduling problem where we had a set of uh, uh, control tasks and services that need to be implemented on a set of office use communicating over bus. And we looked at the problems where the network is the bottleneck, where the ECUs are the bottleneck, that was the, the ends of best paper award, and when both ECUs and the network are bottleneck. And we introduced this kind of security aware design framework where it, it turns out that it's really good to capture this kind of, this kind of intermittent use of, of security uh, primitives as you have normal task behavior, and then occasionally you have this kind of extended execution of the, of the task due to adding these types of, of security primitives. In this particular case is signing the messages that is on the, on the computation side, then transmitting them over the bus that is on the communication side, and then verifying when you receive the message. So occasionally you would have longer packets or longer computation. And now we were able to build this kind of design framework that takes into account platform model, tasks and message model, this kind of reachability analysis that we've built and build this, build this kind of uh, uh, optimal uh, allocation of resources that ensures that all the tasks are still schedulable. So the, the performance stays the same when you don't have attacks, and, but you are able to provide the, 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 the overall quality of control that, 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 is, uh, uh, that is maximized. And then even we have this kind of runtime opportunistic resource allocation, whenever we see empty slots on the bus and we see that, oh, we can add the Mac, let's add the Mac in this particular slot. So uh, with, with Intel, we looked at this kind of automotive case study for SE benchmark. And we looked at like the, the standard benchmark with 52 signals that are sent over, over CAN bus. Uh, and we looked at three control loops, which are adaptive cost control, differential braking, and steering control, and we tried to protect those. And pretty much uh, what, what you can see in this analysis, again, this is not some attack. These are the worst case performance degradation curves 
uh, that are obtained by, by these types of attacks that we were able to generate. So what happens is that, for example, for cruise control, you can see that, that the, 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 this is mean position error that is below the, the, the quality of control. If we just try to allocate resources that, that the overall, that each of these loops have the quality of control that, is, uh, that satisfies certain requirements. If we try to do the optimal allocation, we can even push it extra, as you can see, as you can see here. And finally, that we have the speed error and position error that are below the, 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 the required uh, system uh, constraints. And finally, when we have the, this opportunistic, we can even lower this. So, so pretty much what you end up having is you're able to look at the platform that you have. You're able to integrate these additional security primitives without paying the price when you are not under attack. So you can still drive your, your vehicle. You don't have extra, you don't need extra hardware. You don't need uh, uh, buses with, with, uh, uh, with, with higher bandwidth. So this is, I believe, something that is really important if we, if we want to push this, uh, these systems into the real world. Otherwise, uh, we're going to end up with, uh, with another EPA-like uh, scandal where, where the software will run something to pass the testing, but then they will reduce this security primitive so that they can have quality of control running the way that it's, uh, it's supposed to. Okay, so let's look at some, some other problems on, on here, just to illustrate how, how we have to look at a different formalism. So in one, we looked at more on the, on the continuous state space and how this behaves. Then as we go up the, the, the autonomy stack, we are now looking at, at the short, uh, short horizon and long horizon plan. So for short horizon planning, what we pretty much end up having is we end up with having some kind of automata description of, of the system. So the first thing that we, uh, looked at is, is how can we model this problem from the, the security perspective. So it turns out that finite state transducers are really good way to capture these types of, 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 of attacks on, on, on systems. So uh, using finite state transducers, you can capture any kind of, any kind of, of previously reported attacks, whether we're talking about denial of service attack, where we, for example, where we remove uh, where we uh, uh, non-deterministically remove uh, all of the symbols that belong uh, to, to, to a certain subset of, of, of our alphabet. Or, or we do this projection attack where we don't non-deterministically, but we actually remove all of the symbols like this. Or data injection attacks where we might let the message pass, or we might introduce, uh, when there is nothing to be sent, we actually introduce symbol that belongs to a subset of the, of the, of the alphabet. Injection removal attack, et cetera. We can model replay attacks and, and pretty much all of the reported, previously reported attacks that, that, uh, that require uh, finite memory. So the great thing is about uh, uh, finite state transducers is that now we can use the, the, the mathematical uh, operators for, for serial composition and for parallel composition. And now we can incorporate more powerful attackers that are a combination of, of, of some of these. And as a result, we can then build attack resiliency as, as controllability under attack. So for example, how can we build these kind of supervisors that under certain attack models are still able to ensure that the symbols delivered to the plan belong to a certain land? And we were able to derive both the conditions under which those attackers can be derived, as well as, as how to, to, to derive. What we are currently doing at, at this point is what is deriving these kind of, using these types of results for design of, of, of shields that will be, that will pretty much filter out uh, uh, by making uh, like, ensuring that we have safe execution of the, of the, of the commands that are sent out of the system under uh, known and unknown attack models, and also trying to do this kind of minimal symbol revision uh, such that we can still perform safety while not modifying significantly, the, uh, while not modifying uh, significantly the, the commands that are sent out. So pretty much these were all the results that were focused on the on providing uh, safety in the presence of attack, providing some kind of uh, control guarantees in the, in the presence of attack. Another line of work that we looked at is, is how can we synthesize these kind of modules that can uh, provide 
some kind of uh, opacity or privacy in the presence of attack. And it turns out that, that um, it turns out that these types of, of properties can really be captured well as, as hyper properties. So as a result, you can use the, 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 the existing tools for, for design of, of uh, uh, controllers that satisfy uh, hyper properties. So for example, we've developed one tool uh, that will allow, that can be used for, for, for motion planning. And uh, the, 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 the problem is now to capture this kind of uh, privacy uh, aware motion planning as a suitable hyper property. Um, and uh, of course, we used it for other non-security related uh, uh, properties like uh, optimality of synthesis, pl uh, synthesis plans or robustness. But pretty much what we do is we use hyper LTL uh, as a way to specify these types of, uh, uh, of, of properties. Um, and um, I will not go much about hyper LTL. It's, it's a, it's a well-defined and well-known uh, hyper language to, to capture this kind of uh, uh, linear temporal hyper properties. And then we, uh, for example, capture the properties of initial state capacity as we want to find two paths such that their observations are the same, although they don't start from the same. Uh, uh, so we want to find two paths, meaning two controllers, such that, that the observations along those paths are the same, although they start from, uh, from a different initial state. Or current state opacity, we want to find uh, two, uh, two paths such that both reach goal, but sorry, that, that R reaches goal, but uh, the other one uh, and, 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 and R's are, have the same observations along the, uh, along the, the, the paths. So we were able to design a tool for uh, symbolic, symbolic synthesis from higher to LTL by restricting ourselves to, to finite horizon uh, hyper LTL properties. Uh, we find a way to compute the required horizon over which uh, we will uh, we will look at the, the properties, and then and then we convert the the the, the, the hyper LTL properties into uh, into uh, um, into a suitable into suitable first order formula that then can be easily solved with uh, with an SMP solver. Like in our particular case, it it was uh, it was E three. So, for example, uh, the, the the code and the tool. Uh, uh, is available on, on our kit. And for example, in this particular one, provides the, the, the current state opacity and initial state opacity um, uh, controller. So pretty much we capture that uh, the, the, the Y coordinate is giving the level, the level of Y coordinate is giving the observation. So then how to do paths such that the attacker does not know whether you are going this way or maybe you went this way. So at the ensure that we guarantee the, the, the initial state opacity or the current state uh, current state capacity. So for example, this is one of the of the of the things that, that we've done in this domain. But again, the the, the moral the, of, of this part is that the, the message is that if you're looking at these particular properties, then you really have to, to think about uh, using uh, standard uh, automata and, and language based tools uh, that have been widely used uh, uh, for, for quite some time now. Okay, and finally, let's move um, uh, let's move on the on the final level on the mission planner and, and security aware planning for for autonomous systems. So pretty much what we've looked at in this particular case is how do we need to derive these high level plans when we take into account that potentially some of the information uh, that we deal with may be may be compromised. So the idea that we had was uh, came from this. Um, uh, as a part of our ONR RAMS project from, from the application that we considered. So pretty much there you have a drone that is using GPS to, to move from point A to point B. Of course, GPS based uh, uh, navigation, but it also has an add-on camera that is a, uh, allowing operator to, to, um, uh, to look at uh, before a target is, is engaged. So the system is not using a camera-based navigation because it was not shown as very reliable. Uh, but our idea was, okay, can we occasionally use camera uh, to way to geoposition the drone if potentially it is under attack? And uh, how can we do it in a way that ensures that we have this kind of optimal trade-off between the reduct performance degradation and the 
security, security guarantees. So we started looking at that particular problem, how to plan a path for a drone that maybe goes over certain, over certain, like in this map, over, over certain landmarks that will allow the camera to easily geoposition uh, without using uh, GPS coordinates. So to do that, I mean, we start from the standard models. These are MDP models or POMDP models from, from UAV and, uh, and advisory system. And of course, we now have to add the, the advisory model. So uh, adversary model. So pretty much what happens is, is that if the UAV model says go north, the adversary uh, has to constrain himself by saying, okay, you can go north, east, or west. So the, the, the errors that can be introduced cannot be significantly high so that the lower levels of control do not detect these types of attacks. So when you have these types of system, it's a, it's, in some sense, you would say it's an MDP. Um, we can use, let's say, whatever is your favorite tool for, for synthesis. Let's use PRISM, for example. The only problem with that one is that our camera, our advisory system model, whether it will be able to geoposition when it turns on the camera depends on what it thinks the true va the belief value of where the UAV is and the true value of where the UAV is. And as a result, what you end up in this particular system, the adversary knows both true value and belief values, but the UAV does not have a clue what the true value is. And this is a standard uh, problem that you have in security, what you end up having is a hidden information to player games, and there are no tools that can be synthesized, uh, uh, that can be used to synthesize uh, strategies. So what we did in this particular setup is, is the following. We looked at if we, let's say that we ensure that once every 20 minutes or 10 minutes, we will use the camera to geoposition itself. So we still need to, in some sense, break this, this game. So if we use this kind of very basic, very basic uh, assumption, what we can do then is we can introduce this kind of delayed action representation. So what does that mean? What we do is we look at the executions of the system. So in our previous game, the system makes a move and then the attacker makes a move. And, but the attacker's move is constrained by what the system did. Then, Again, the system makes a move and then attacker makes a move, again, constrained by what the system did. So what we now do is the following thing. We just reorder the execution of this. So we start with, uh, with having all the executions of the system. So the system goes north, north. So in this particular setup, the system goes north and the system goes west and et cetera. So this is the, the belief state and this is the, the true state. So we first play all the actions of the system, and then we play all the actions on the, of, the, of the attacker. So instead of having them interleave like this, what we do is we do this. Okay, so then the critical, what we call this is, is this kind of delay action game. And what is critical here was for us to be able to show that we have this kind of, uh, that, we can, uh, uh, that we can use delay, uh, uh, a delayed action game for synthesis was to show that when we restrict ourselves to these types of, 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 of execution that uh, on a subset of execution that actually relevant to initial system, we have the, the simulation be relation between these, between, these two, uh, between these two games from the perspective of the system. But there is this crucial assumption that, I mean, we have to make a finite memory of the, of the actions of the system. That means that we need after a certain time to to trigger this kind of uh, uh, camera to, to detect where we are in order to be able to, uh, to build, uh, in order to be able to um, restrict the, the size of the, of the model. So what we then did is by, after showing this in, in our CAV paper in, in uh, last year, we, we show how we can automatically starting from, from, uh, from these classical models, uh, how can we build this delayed action game and then how can we, uh, uh, by also add these additional memory components, use that to synthesize strategies, and then based on these synthesized strategies, check what is, for example, the maximum probability of, of, um, of uh, reaching a goal while staying, uh, uh, while staying, uh, uh, while not being, uh, uh, while not reaching the, the, the danger zone in, in this particular setup that we, that we consider. 
So in this setup, what we had was we have full knowledge of the of the system model, and that's why we were able to use model checking, and that's why we we were able to use uh, uh, Prism after some 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 tweaking with uh, with the tool. So now we we started saying, okay, what happens if we if we cannot do that? What if we don't know exactly the model of the system? Um, not only probabilities, but we don't fully know even the, 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 the underlying topology of the model, which states are connected to which states, etc. So in order to, to, to look at this problem, what we, we've started with our, our recent results on, on model-free control synthesis from LPLs, and we show how, how we can use limit deterministic Yuki automata to map LTL properties, and then, then we combine them with MVPs, and based on that, we are able to do this kind of model-free learning that maximizes these controllers. So we then extended this result. This is a paper that uh, that we submitted yesterday to um, to uh, a a AI uh, that we solve this kind of problem for. So we cannot do this for uh, for general LTLs, but what we are able to do is for uh, for rubbing games, of course, and Yuki as a subset of there with a, with a single rabbit pair, and we are able to find we are able to find uh, uh, we are able to find strategies that maximize probability of of reaching the sorry that that maximize uh, minimal probability of of reaching the the goal. So this is still where we don't have a stealthy attacker. Now at this process we are. To extend in combining these two work, works and and in order to be able to to provide these kind of uh, stronger stronger guarantees. So previously, as I said, we we mostly focus by by covering these these three different layers. We focused on on how can we build resiliency of uh, uh, how can we improve resiliency of these control algorithms and autonomy algorithms at different levels of of, uh, uh, of, 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 of this abstraction. And we looked at different architectures, whether they are more traditional controllers, uh, more traditional intrusion detectors like chi-square or the SPRT or et cetera, or we looked at uh, a more modern like database intrusion uh, detectors. The problem that happens is that the moment we start looking at, let's say, real systems, for example, like we look at, let's say, Peacock, uh, uh, software that is that is running there. All of a sudden, uh, um, the, the 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 abstractions that are used in in, in some of these uh, uh, in some of these uh, setups are not. Um, I mean, we can abstract the behavior, but of course, like with every model, we introduce uh, certain errors. So the problem that we started to consider is is can we do any kind of analysis of, of these systems without, uh, uh, while dealing with, with really complexity, without really trying to significantly abstract the, 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 the behavior of, of, of these systems? And in order to do that, we started exploring in parallel this, this approach to doing the statistical model checking as a way to provide assurance in, um, in these systems. And uh, initially, we started looking at, of course, the, 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 the classical properties of, of uh, reachability and safety, etc. But now we, we've extended this because we've started looking at the problem of, for example, can we attack a certain attack? And it turns out that those types of problems can be captured as, as, as hyper properties. So for example, um, one of the, the, the important properties uh, in, in, in CPS is, uh, that we consider is, can we detect, it, for this particular system, is there a way to detect uh, uh, whether an attack occurs? So in some sense, that can be captured as other two paths such that both of them look the, the, the somewhat the same from the perspective of the system and the intrusion detector, where one is a valid one and one is, is a result of, of a bad attack. Of course, if the attack stays within the noise profile, you cannot do that, but if the attack can reach an unsafe state uh, while ensuring that, that for example, the, the attacker stays uns, uns, uh, um, stealthy. So to do that, we have to pretty much look at, at the, the uh, relationship between, uh, between multiple, multiple paths and these effectively are, are hyper properties. So what we then did is we started from, from our 
other work that was not security related as much that was looking at, for example, providing assurance of the systems where you have uh, modeling errors. And, um, and let, we looked at, at, uh, at a walking robot benchmark that is using uh, deep reinforcement learning to, to perform control. And we said like, okay, what happens if due to wear and tear, some of these, some of these, uh, uh, um, uh, some of the properties of the system, uh, properties of the system change. So pretty much you can look at that as a, as a probabilistic hyper property, meaning that if you start from, uh, from the same state um, and let's say that with, in your nominal period, you enter the desired region at time P1, is there another path that has parameters of the system that uh, differ from the initial one, but still belong to, 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 a certain, uh, to a certain region that will enter this desired range within, the, within a certain amount of time. So for example, that is a probabilistic sensitivity property and, and we were able to derive uh, um, for these kind of uh, 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 systems that we are also interested in, in, in continuous state space representation, uh, we are able to build this kind of analysis. How we were able to do that, where we introduce this hyper probabilistic signal temporal logic, which is an extension of, of signal temporal logic and, and hyper STL by allowing us to, to look at this kind of, to add these probabilistic quantifiers. And then based on that one, we were able to capture the, the, the properties um, like robustness and sensitivity, and also to derive suitable uh, statistical model checking uh, uh, algorithms. But what was important for us from the security perspective was this kind of probabilistic detectability. And pretty much you can capture that as a, as a, as a hyper property that says uh, it's stated here, but pretty much the idea is, is if after uh, the, a certain input uh, uh, occurs, the, the, the output between two paths uh, should be different only if, if the first one stays within the operating limit, which is the noise, while the other one overshoots. So pretty much the, the, the intrusion detector should probabilistically trigger uh, alarm only if the, 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 the second path that is assigned with the attacker uh, leaves this kind of uh, noise profile uh, that, that, that we have. So we build that on top of, on top of our hyper SMC tool for, for these types of, of logical formulas and we looked at, at, at the range of, of both learning and more of the traditional benchmarks like, like Toyota Powertrain benchmarks. And like with all of the, all of the um, uh, statistical model checking parts, we were able to show, uh, I mean, it scales very well, but of course, like all of the guarantees are, are probabilistic with uh, desired confidence levels. We have now extended this to, uh, to more of the, um, um, Hyper PCTL uh, for more security related properties. This is a, um, a CSF paper that, will, that has just been accepted where we look at different types of properties, whether we are looking at, at, uh, at uh, um, um, side channel information leakage in cache coherence protocols uh, or, or some of the more traditional uh, security problems. Okay, so this in some sense captures the, 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 the whole level that we looked at, at these kind of problems from the, from the low level control uh, to the, the high level security where we should have. The final part of this puzzle are, fortunately or unfortunately, depends how you look at this, are humans. Uh, you always have these humans as, as, as part of the, of the system based on the level of autonomy, they are more or less involved in the, in the system operation. And, um, and as a part of, of, um, of our work as both from supported as, as by the ONR as well as our new um, center of excellence by the uh, uh, IFOSR where uh, my lab is leading the, the, the attack resilient uh, uh, part of the thrust of the, of the, of the center. Uh, we also started looking at this problem on, on, uh, on the human impact again. We have to look at certain, uh, whether is it um, uh, standard uh, physics-based or data-based uh, models. So in order to do that, what we did is we developed this kind of um, uh, test bed where we are able to capture the dynamics of, of the drones, but we are also able to attack, uh, capture different types of, of attacks. So 
let let's let me just comment uh, on on the video. This is one run, for example, that we have here. So pretty much is the same setup that I described for security aware planning, but here instead of using uh, um, uh, instead of using uh, um, software to check uh, geo position based on camera, we use humans for geo positioning uh, where they occasionally look at uh, the, the camera. So the humans is still a, uh, the, the, in this particular task, what the humans need to do, uh, they need to do the following thing. These are the drones and the drones need to reach targets. Um, uh, the, the, the humans can override autonomy and add additional waypoint. This is pretty much how, how is designed, how it's being done in the, in the, in the current uh, systems with varying levels of autonomy. And uh, pretty much once the, the, a drone reaches a target, the human needs to look at the camera and do certain cognitive tasks allowing the, the system to engage or not engage. So what happens here is that this information that is presented here is actually the information that's being delivered to the system. And this can be what the system thinks where, for example, if it's under GPS spoofing, where it is. But the camera, we assume, is not under attack as in the system that is considered. And uh, the, the feed is being, uh, is being provided to the, to the operator in, in real time. So what we started looking at here was two different problems. The first one is, is can the user help? For example, if, if the system occasionally does not have, uh, it's not very confident, it's not under attack, it might ask the user to, uh, to, to, to help geo position and maybe provide, increase the confidence that's not under attack. And the other thing is maybe if we provide this kind of information, can we, can we mess up with, uh, with, uh, with the user, with the operator, such that, that, that he or, or, or she does not perform the task that they perform, potentially avoid, uh, uh, causing mod confusion and, uh, and, uh, and affecting performance of the overall system. So to do that, we were able to, to run human experiments on, 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 on um, human subjects, looking at low workload and high workload uh, 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 missions, and we built and we uh, and we built um, uh, uh, operator behavior model in this kind of uh, human supervisory control, which then allowed us to to reason when is the best way to 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 to, to launch certain attacks so that we can confuse the user, and also when is the best way uh, best time to to ask the user potentially to look at the camera, but also. Uh, but also how to do this by combining with, with our previous uh, care work, how to do this in a way that we incorporate that in the, in the path planning, such that we organize the paths to the, from, from, to the target in a way that, that it can increase our quality, uh, the, 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 the user feedback that we get in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in real time. It turns out, of course, like with all uh, human, uh, human experiments when we run this on, on humans, it turns out, so we used again PRISM to generate, we built these models based on experiments, we used PRISM and, and learning to, to synthesize these paths. We then evaluated on, on humans and it turns out that um, there is one class where it works very well and there is one, uh, there is a larger part where it doesn't work very well. And it turns out that gamers work very well, but in some sense, gamers are people who are more closer to this domain experts. Um, they were actually doing human experiments is horrible because, for example, some users were able to figure out if they if they put a lot of 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 uh, uh, set points, they would be able to delay our delay our. Uh, 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 GUI and, and then they would be able to figure out whether they are under attack or not. So finally, but one thing is when we resolved that and redid the experiment, it turns out that domain expertise really helped and we were able to, to significantly improve the, 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 the guarantees that we could have in this account. So with this, I would like to, 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 to end and, and, and just to the, the, the take home message would be that we really need to think about both these kind of cyber and, and physical mechanisms, whether we are looking at physics or, or data-based methods and, and, and models. We really need to be able to design these kind of tools and design frameworks that, that are based on, on actually formalisms that are used in, in different layers of the, of the, of the autonomy. Um, 
in a lot of C setups, the complexity prevents us from directly using some of the, 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 the systems, uh, some of the, the formal uh, methods, uh, tools, so then potentially combination of those and, and like what we did in, in some of our work, statistical model checking can help, especially when we move toward probabilistic reasoning, which is something that we have to do when we are dealing with, with this kind of very uncertain environments, when we do this kind of high level planning, and especially when we do this uh, learning as a, as a part of the overall system. And finally, we have to think about uh, platform aware integration. How can we do this? It was awesome being on, on uh, Hakam's because in some sense we were not thinking as much about resources. The, we had the clean slate architecture. But if we are looking at the resource constraints systems where we cannot run easily everything that we want to run, how can we then build this kind of very important quantifiable trade-offs between the overall guarantees and the resources slash cost of, of our system. So with that, I would like to thank you for, for the invitation to present. And I would definitely like to, to, to thank all of my sponsors and all of my students who made this and for those who, who, who actually did the work. Um, thank you all. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Tristan, did you want to ask yours about the analog? Uh, sure. I was curious early on when you were talking about uh, malicious signals, were you thinking mostly um, network-based signals or was that, would that include like analog attacks against sensors or does it not really matter in the context of the level of modeling you were working on? Um, as you're talking about um, you're talking about motion. Uh, can you please repeat the first part? Sorry, Jason. Uh, you you were talking about um, sort of malicious signals that could uh, sort of take control of the system, and and I definitely got the feeling that it was more oriented towards messages on an, on the network, like on the CAN bus that were malicious and injected. Uh, does it would that also cover things like analog attacks against sensors, so, or does it not really matter to the at the level of modeling you're working on? Perfect. From perspective of, of the feedback, from perspective of the, of, the, of the closed loop system, it really doesn't make any difference whether, let's say, your GPS has been spoofed by non-invasive attack or whether someone was able to do the man-in-the-middle attack and uh, replace the message that has been done. So let's say, like I know, what you have, like if you're running this on ROS, you send the message, you write it into topic, and if it's not like you immediately overwrite it with something else, from the perspective of the system, that's the same as if you have the, 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 the spoof the GPS. So, so it really doesn't make any difference from, the, from this kind of algorithmic perspective. It does make a lot of difference on, on what you can protect against. I mean, you cannot protect against as easily against, the, sorry, you cannot protect against these non-invasive attacks in the same way. Um, there are ways of, and, and we did that as, as well, there are others that have done in the sense of doing this kind of active, meaning, for example, imagine that you shake your GPS and then you, as you move, you start to see that you have the change in the phase if you have the three-dimensional, uh, which is not the case if you do spoofing from the, from the, from the planet, from the Earth. Uh, so that is in some sense the similar way of, of doing, the, like I know, this kind of spoofing attacks if occasionally you you, you shake your drone and you should see like perturbations on your IMUs. So those kind of things are inside of like you are inserting, you're doing control such that you are inserting using these kind of sensors to insert, I don't want to say signatures, watermarks or whatever, but you are doing these kind of things to, to insert something so that you can check whether your sensors are behaving the way they are supposed to. Uh, but against these attacks, you cannot protect in the standard cyber whatever is the crypto uh, uh, mechanism that you want to use. Got it, thanks. Well, if that's it, I will... Uh... Stop the recording and um, so if there's no more questions, Aditya. Okay. Um,